Seaman has been in jail for the past 14 years for killing her husband. Found guilty of murder in the first degree and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I got a chance to speak with her on the phone earlier this week, and I started by asking her to describe the events that led up to her husband's death that fateful day. Watch. There was a knife on the kitchen counter, but I, it wasn't until I got into the kitchen and the argument ensued that he cut me on the hand with the knife. And that was when I reached across the counter to grab my coffee cup and my keys, and he, he just took the knife and glanced it across my hand and then it started to bleed and I think that's when I kind of just went into shock so I just I panicked and I I just ran so he followed you into the garage he pushed you down yes and what happened next I was on the ground and I crawled to the back of the garage um, and then he came after me I was fearful because the six prior months had been so abusive and when he pinned me to the ground I twisted my body and I reached for some leverage to pull myself away from him. When I went to reach for the handle of the generator, there was a hatchet was laying on top of it. I felt the handle of it, I grabbed it, and I just swung it across my body with a lot of force. And when he fell on me, that feeling, that heaviness of his body felt like a continuing attack. I felt that before when he's been on top of me and I just panicked. People want to know two things. Number one, why did you buy the hatchet the night before, the very hatchet that you used to kill him? And number two, why didn't you call the police immediately to tell them what had happened? Okay, anyone who knows me uh, knows why I bought the hatchet the night before. For 31 years, I did all the yard work at three of our homes. And that's what I did. I bought that hatchet because I had not done my regular fall maintenance on the yard. Megan, if I wanted to kill my husband, I didn't need to go to a store to buy anything. I lived in a house with hammers and wrenches and crowbars and tire irons, and I had access to guns. No one is going to believe that it's logical for a woman to buy a hatchet and engage in a face-to-face -face confrontation with someone who's going to overpower her. It just doesn't make any sense. So why, after you killed him, didn't you call the police immediately? I, it never entered my mind. And I'll tell you why. is because of my two prior experiences with the police. Um, uh, long ago, on some subconscious level, I had eliminated them as a, a course of help for me. But now you've got a dead body in your garage. It's laying on the floor for three days. And I, I know a question a lot of people ask is, why did I clean everything up? And for 31 years... I denied the reality of Bob's violence. I cleaned up all the evidence of it. The prosecution says you did a lot for somebody who was in a state of shock. You went to work, you bought cleaning supplies, you cleaned up the mess in the garage, you wrapped his body in a tarp, you wrapped him so tight he was like a mummy. They suggest these are not the actions of somebody in shock, but somebody trying to cover up a crime she knows she's committed. That would be fine, except that's what I did for 31 years. I put everything back the way that it was. I had tried to convince myself nothing ever happened. Why, when the police showed up, did you tell them that Bob had gone on a trip to find himself um, and that you were in the process of an amicable separation? I had convinced myself, I had to convince myself that Bob was just away. I had to convince myself that this didn't happen. Megan, if I, had if I had not slipped into denial as I did, I probably would have committed suicide. How hard was that to hear your son Jeff testify against you? Uh, I wasn't surprised. He absolutely idolized his father. He didn't just love him, he idolized him. And Jeff said this in an interview after the trial. He said, how can I love my father if I believe he did this to my mother? So you see that how difficult that would have been for him to reconcile those two things. So to those who would say, look, the jury heard all this and did not find this credible, so why mess with their verdict? What say you? I will tell you that the scariest thing a person can ever go through in life is a jury trial. There were no juror members on that jury panel that had any experiences with, with domestic violence, had any relatives that had domestic violence, or anything else. So I'm, I'm looking at supposedly a jury of my peers who have no idea what I'm talking about. 
The fact that I kept the abuse a secret for 31 years didn't bode well for me. Nancy, do you, do you feel guilty? Do you feel guilty when you think about Bob's murder? Yes, I'm responsible for his death. I did not plan to do it, but nevertheless, he is dead. A life was lost, and I am responsible for that. And every single day, I think about that. I think about the loss and the pain I've caused to his family and my sons. I'm terribly ashamed of how this turned out because I worked so very hard to leave the marriage peacefully. Yes, I feel guilty. Welcome back, everyone. So Lynn Bronson was an alternate juror on that jury that eventually convicted Nancy Seaman of first-degree murder for killing her husband of 31 years. It took the jury less than six hours to decide Nancy's fate, and Lynn says there's a reason for that. Lynn, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you. So, you know, by now they've, heard, they, they've now heard Nancy's testimonial. You know, I, I had easier ways of doing it. I was a domestic violence victim. Um, and you heard... The, the judge talking about how the, the jury didn't hear a link between the domestic violence expert testimony and Nancy specifically. So would that have changed the way you saw the case? Uh, from my point of view, no. I would have kept the same, same thought process behind what we felt, why we felt what we felt. Why? About why were you so sure that it was first degree? Um, you know, first and foremost, it was uh, the way she just the actions that took place after the fact. Um, Self-defense, I can understand. We're not here to be disp uh, disputing whether or not she was um, abused, but what we're disputing is, did she plan the murder? And I believe, and I believe she did. She goes to Home Depot on a stormy night in Detroit and ends up buying a hatchet to do yard work in the rain, okay? And then, and then, um, she continues to go through um, her testimony. Never once did she cry. I mean, being a female myself, I would think there would have been some level of tears shed to show remorse. That never happened. Uh, furthermore, she really, I mean, self-defense is one thing, but hitting somebody 38 times uh, with a hatchet and with a knife, and, and when most of I mean, how many times does it take to kill somebody? Um, they, they describe that as overkill, right? And yeah. That, and which suggests some sort of, you know, emotion is involved in it, but that doesn't mean, you know, it was not self-defense or was. Right. Um, what about the motive? What did you think her motive was? Because, you know, as the judge points out, she had bought a condo. It seemed like she was extricating herself from the marriage. So why would she go kill him then? Because, you know, what the experts will tell you is a domestic violence victim is most in danger when she says she's leaving. And so that's their point, that mm -hmm. it makes more sense to, to believe she said she was leaving. He got angry. He attacked her, as she said. Again, we're not here to dispute whether or not there was violence in the home. The point here is that she planned the murder. She thought through it. I mean, the fact that she had uh, bleach and stuff to clean up after she killed him, she painted walls, she cleaned the garage, um, she tarped him up. <laughs> Uh, it's just, it's to me, it just nothing was adding up in her testimony. And, uh, you know, hearing the, the, the testimony of other individuals, it really just made me feel like, I, again, from my point of view, she was guilty of first degree murder. Judge, one of the facts we haven't gotten to is the fact that not only did Nancy buy that hatchet and then the hatchet was used, but she went back to Home Depot and yes. she shoplifted a second hatchet after the murder. And she then used her original receipt from the first ha hatchet to return the stolen hatchet, which looks like she looks had, like she had consciousness of guilt. It, it looks, looks like, like consciousness of guilt. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. I, I made a comment myself that she was a very unsympathetic witness. She was very rigid. She was very in self-control. She showed no emotions. I, had, I never met Nels till yesterday, but I was telling him yesterday, if that would have been my wife on the stand, you wouldn't be able to understand her because she'd be sobbing and crying so much. Nancy wasn't that way at all. But I come back to one thing, not just one thing, but several things. She's going to file for divorce. There's no question about that. Did you believe that? Uh, Did you believe the testimony she borrowed $10,000 from her father to buy a condo? Did you believe that? Yes. But did he, you believe that the two sons would not tell her father because they knew if they did, he'd go into a complete rage? No. You, you don't believe that? No. Okay. 
You, you accepted Jeff's testimony, but not Greg's. No, I accept both of their testimonies. You did? Well, you know what Greg said. One was one and way I and the other I believe Jeff way. also said that, but there's 14 But just on the balance of the evidence, Judge, you know, I she's know, saying the point I'm she's to the it. juror, right? It's like the judge gets to control the process, but the jury gets oh, the I'm final say. I'm not arguing. I'm just asking you questions. I know, but it's scary to have the judge <laughs> confront you like that. <laughs> Lynn's doing us a favor by being here. Wait, I'm scarer. <laughs> It's scary for me being here knowing that I reversed a jury verdict, which is very seldom done. But yeah. I just did. It was bothering my conscience. Yep. What and do you I, think I the odds go, are? Let me ask you this. I go back to the fact that she was leaving the home. I got she it. I got it. But what do you think the odds are that, that Governor Snyder is going to do anything about this? I have this? no idea. Because Governor Granholm did not on her way out of office. I don't know. that. She, did she ask for a commutation? Or, uh, I, I believe she did. I, yeah, I, she I, did. I didn't know that. And she didn't do it. Now you got Governor Snyder who, you know, well, we'll see, right? We'll see. I mean, she's pushing we for it. Know. I will tell you that we did reach out to another juror. You were an alternate juror. We reached out to another juror. This person didn't want to give their name, but told us that they they have no problem with the verdict. They, they do believe Nancy is guilty of first degree. They also said they didn't, they wouldn't have a problem if she were released. You know, they didn't view her as an ongoing threat to society. So that's for you. I wanted to tell you as well that we reached out to the prosecutor who tried the case against Nancy. Uh, her name is Lisa Gorsica, and she's now a judge, too. She writes to us in part that Nancy Siemens' guilt was decided by 12 jurors who rejected her battered spouse defense and found her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of first-degree premeditated murder. Her conviction was litigated for years at all levels of the state and federal courts. I fully support the jury's verdict and the decisions of the state and federal courts upholding that verdict. Thank you all so much. We'll be right back. Hello today, fans. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking that button down there and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives.